everyone. In this tutorial, we're going to go over what it takes to start a watercolor in Rebel 5 Pro. But now keep in mind, I am not going to be using any of the special added features that are in the Pro version that are not in the standard version. So for that reason, you could use either version to follow along with this particular tutorial. Uh, now, with that said, uh, what we're going to do is cover a little bit of everything. We're going to see just how many things have to come together to create a digital watercolor. We'll be going over the paper, the colors, the brushes, the visual settings, the keyboard shortcuts, uh, even a little bit of composition to just try and tie all things together. Uh, with that all said, uh, there is a lot of things that you may want to keep in mind, but sometimes it's overwhelming if you try and learn everything about everything. So for that reason, uh, there's an Old Navy acronym in mind that we should keep it uh, just as in the back of our head, and that would be KISS. Keep it simple, stupid, and I'm saying that lightly only because it really would apply here. And the more simple you keep it when you're starting off, the better off and less frustrated you'll be. But more importantly, the faster you will learn how to get your finished result as to where you want. Because the, the goal here would be to try and just do some kind of a painting that we could be happy with and then look forward to doing our next one. Uh, otherwise, if we fight our brushes, if we fight our colors, if we fight the water, everything involved with all different parameters, then it's just gonna frustrate us and, and we're gonna be wondering where to turn next. So with that in mind, let's start from the very beginning and that's just choosing our paper and what to start with from there. Okay, let's go through the paper. Uh, just as actually, uh, just to start off with, first open up Rebel 5. Uh, this is the panel you'll get, and it's for just new artwork, or you can open up your recent. And just to show you, here's my previous demo. I'll just click on it, and when it opens, Now that it's open, then this is uh, my previous tutorial. It's just the oil painting of the portrait of the great blue heron. And then now that you can see, there's quite a few different layers involved. Uh, but what we'll do is we'll, we'll uh, actually open up a new sheet. And we'll go to here. And then if we want to start with a watercolor, then, then we could go through all new uh, settings. And if we want to start with print... These are the given default settings as just standard sizes of paper. Uh, and then if you want to go to screen, then this would be more or less like the HD settings, 2K, 4K. Uh, that's just screen dimensions with a 16-9 ratio. And that is, if you're doing something for a video, then you could choose those sizes. Now your favorites, uh, that is just the ones you would use all the time. I commonly use 12 by 18 or 18 by 12. If we go back to the print, then here's the 12 by 18, 18 by 12. If you like any of these sizes in any of these choices, then all you have to do is just click on the star and it'll put it in your favorites for you. And then you could just go back to the favorites all the time and then just uh, actually pick something out there. But now if I use the 18 by 12 or 12 by 18, here is your DPI drop down right here. These are the choices of what DPI you can use. But again, I would always keep things the same because if you even start changing the DPI, then that's gonna start changing the size of your brushes and how they may, re may react. So again, uh, if you keep the paper, the visual settings, the brushes, the water settings, a lot of the things you use as consistent as possible, then if you go to either paint or make changes, then you'll get a better idea what to expect of what kind of change you can make. But right now, we'll just leave this on 300 DPI and then we'll also, I'll just leave it in inches, whatever form of measurement you use, that's up to you. And then this is if you want to change it from a portrait to a landscape, it will definitely keep the sizes the same, but it'll just change the format. So I'll use a 12 by 18. And then now if I actually want to check my paper out, the Arches watercolor paper for traditional, there was two different versions. One was like an off-white and the other one was a bright white. And the off-white was kind of like a real light cream color. And the bright white was a just all white, which is six Fs. So I would pick that, pick my handmade paper, depending on how many different types of papers you have down here. Again, I would just try to stay with the same material, same settings, uh, just to get yourself started. If I make those two choices then i just hit okay and now my paper set 
and then now if any of these settings you like or if you start a new setting then all you have to do is hit this plus button and it'll put that setting up in here for you wherever you want to keep it and then again a star will put it in your favorites now if i like everything that i just chose then i just hit ok and it'll generate that size of a paper for me but now now that we have our paper set and our and what paper we're going to use as we zoom in, we'll be able to see the paper texture much better. Uh, and then that way we will actually then move on and let's talk about color next. Okay, let's first talk about color. But one important thing to remember about this tutorial, I will definitely not have the time to go over each and every option you have uh, as far as all the tools and settings you go. So if you want to really find out a particular tool or a particular setting, look at the in individual tutorials on that particular tool or setting and really understand it in depth if you need to go there. Now for me to keep it simple, I came out of a traditional painting background, so these are the paints I use. Uh, I won't go through them individually, but they mix well in a traditional sense, so these are the colors I used, and they, uh, they also have specific secondary colors that mix well, and that's something we don't have to worry about in, in digital. Now these are the colors I came up with that I came up with a complete set that have a few more colors than my watercolors only because I also threw in some oil and acrylic paint colors in there also. So for that reason, this is the palette I use for everything. And in a traditional painting sense, I've always heard that the colors that an artist chooses to use is their personal signature. Uh, everybody's color palette is unique only to them. So that's one thing you keep in mind if you decide to go uh, with a, a specific palette for good that are they going to be all real bright vivid colors are they going to be all uh, deep dark colors are they going to have a little bit of in between uh, that is something you could consider if you decide to go with a permanent palette route uh, we will go over all the different ways you could uh, come up with colors but right now uh, this is how i came up with mine and if you want you can actually also i made a rather elaborate chart that if you decide to come up with your own colors sometimes it helps you that i pulled out all the different places i could get a hex color from and i found out that they are very different so how everybody perceives a burnt sienna to be then that may depend on also your choice or how you perceive it because keep in mind if you want to get technical it's even going to depend on how you have your monitor set and a lot of background information that has nothing to do with choosing your digital colors now uh, I made this just to pull my final colors which are right here and that's these right here and that's the ones I'm going to stay with now if you want to not go that route and go through all that then you could easily just use one of the uh, given palettes that are already started for you and then you could change them from there or even be happy with those colors right there uh, these some of these default colors are, are very elaborate setups that you could have the crayon colors just for example the color wheel here is mine i just call it tag 26 because that's just my initials and and the 26 colors i use all the time now keep in mind i don't use black at all since rebel will mix the colors as a third color then i use all blues and browns to come up with my grays so then that way if i want a warm gray i'll just add more brown if i want a cool gray i'll add more blue and depending on like for shadow areas or something like that you have to take the shadow in a context that if you really want it blue, you can make it blue, but if you want it brown, you can make it brown. Sometimes it's better to create a shadow that looks more like it has to do with the painting versus uh, it looks like an individual shape floating above the painting. Now, that said, uh, take a look at some other ways that you could choose your colors. Okay, let's take a look at some other ways we could get colors. Uh, for our painting and if you go to window under the main drop down and then just hit reference images right here uh, it'll bring up this panel I already have it out and then to open it up just click on that bar right there and then this is where your reference images would be to load it up with reference images all you have to do is click down here on the right side of it the left button import a new image and then if you click on that it'll take you to a folder system within your PC or Mac or whatever you're using and then you can find out where it's at. I have it in a quick access. 
uh, and then here's my reference right here. Now if I click on that and then open it, uh, this is what I'll get. And then if I click on it, here's our reference image. Now, here's the thing. This eyedropper right here, uh, use this one versus this one because this is your regular tools palette and if you click on this one then you'll be turning your tool into an eyedropper and you'd have to turn it back every time you want to use a brush uh, so if you use this one here and select this one then it's going to turn into a, a, a color picker when it, when you're floating over the reference image but if you have just say for example a brush and you want to just use red and then you can use red now or whatever color you pick. If I pick a color here, then this is the color I'd be using. And the color you pick will come out right here in the upper left-hand corner of your color set. Or if you're using the color wheel, it'll be up in the upper left-hand corner of it. But what it'll do is you could go back to a brush every time you go back to your canvas or your paper. So that way, if you want to pick a new color, it will automatically turn into a, a eyedropper, a color picker, and then you can then uh, go back to your canvas and start painting with that new color. Now that's if you want to just pull the colors right from uh, your reference image. And now uh, what you can also then do is just generate an actual palette of colors from that reference image. But then if just for example, if I use mine, then I would know that if I go working into this area here, I would use the, the quinacridone gold, the cadmium orange, the burnt sienna, uh, the sepia for the, the shadowed areas. Those are the colors I already know I would use. And by keeping my choices down to a minimum, then I, I still can produce whatever I want uh, just with the given colors I have. But now if you want to actually create a set of colors uh, from this reference image, then you would just go to the color set drop down menu which is right here and then if you click on that and then right here is create color set from image file and we could drop the whole way down to 36 and then click on it and it'll take you into the same folder system in your PC or Mac whatever you're using again and then if you click on your reference picture the same picture it will produce a 36 color palette color palette for you uh, to work from now, for example, if you start lo looking a little bit closer and you start seeing some blues or reds or maybe like a brownish purple, you miss with your color picker or it not, might not be quite uh, vibrant enough of what it picked out, you could add colors to that. And just by actually even going to clicking on the color, current color itself, and just say, for example, I want uh, just maybe say a, a brownish purple and I'll just give it some black. And then if I slide it over to red a little bit more, it's going to go brown. And then just say right there, maybe that color right there, if I hit OK. Now that's the current color I just chose. And what I could do is then if I want to add that to my permanent set, then all I have to do is hit this right here, add the color, and then I'll add the color to my permanent set. That way I can add colors if I want a vibrant blue or just something to snap it up. To change it a little bit from the photograph, then I can add new colors to that. Now, if you start working with a lot of different colors uh, that start adding up, then you can actually even also create right here, which create a color set from the last used colors. If I click on that, then now this is a color set of all these colors. But then it'll keep on adding your sets. This one right here is the one we just made from the photograph. And what it'll do is it'll just name it whatever uh, the file name you gave your picture. Now my picture is just PA16782 because that is my Pennsylvania photograph of number 16,782. So I have every one of my photographs individually numbered depending on what state I photographed it from. But now keep that in mind that if I go back to this photo and I want to work from it again, then I could bring up that particular palette knowing that that was the painting that I was working on at the time. Uh, and then this new palette, uh, you could pretty much, the new color set, it's just going to come up new color set until you name it whatever you want, and then just double click on it, and it'll give you a, a bar that you could type in what name you want on it. Now, if uh, the color sets, uh, if you want to go back to one, here's my original color set, and all you have to do is just click on whatever color set you want to work from. Next, let's just go into uh, the actual color wheel, and that will give you a lot of different options to work from also. Okay, let's take a look and see, for those who want to use the color wheel, 
Now you could do this a couple of different ways too. There is uh, quite literally millions of colors that you could pick. If you just leave it like this, then whatever color you pick going around the circle, these sliders change down here and all those controls are within this drop down menu. You could either have a circle or a square uh, and then uh, you could also if I go back to the circle, I'll show you. Then a grid, if you want to change these different ones into a grid, the sliders at the bottom. So if you want the sliders on the bottom, you can have the sliders, and then that will show you the numeric values, depending on whether you have hue, saturation, or value, or hue, saturation, and lightness. They're roughly the same, but you'll see that if you have, just for example, hue, saturation, I'll change it to hue, saturation, and lightness, if I take this slider and move it back and forth, then it's just moving uh, your reference point straight up and down, and it's either adding white or black to the color you have. Uh, so that way, depending on what you'll have, it's a little wee bit set up different that if you'll notice the black is on the bottom, the white is on top, and all the colors and values of, of that particular color are in between. If you actually go to the... Uh, HSV, which is the hue, saturation, and value, then now it's it's just a though the white is is up in the upper left hand corner, the black is down in the bottom left hand corner and towards the right, and then your color is actually the true pure color is on, on the upper right hand corner. So that way, depending on where you pick, your sliders are going to move as you're picking a color, but then you could also adjust for value or what have you, if you want to add uh, more white or more black to a, a given color, then you might even want to just use a slider and adjust one specific part of your color, whether, whether it be the hue. Now the hue is just going to take it actually the whole way around uh, your, your circle, and then that way uh, you will get actually 360 because there's also a zero. So with zero, and then going up to 359, it's technically 360 different hues. And we could show that just by going to here. And then if we go to grid, and then we'll hit actually, uh, just say uh, right here, go down to 36. And then there's your 36. And that would be technically the 360. Uh, you could actually then go down and what it's doing is it's dividing it down for you a little bit more so you don't have uh, literally millions of colors. Now you may have thousands. <laughs> so uh, depending on each one of these you pick, it's giving you a starting point as to where to start, but then you still have all these different values within each one of these 36 points. So again, uh, just getting back uh, uh, to the KISS acronym, I uh, try to keep it simple. Uh, if you overwhelm yourself with literally thousands of colors to choose from, when some of them are very subtle being apart, that might be a little bit too much. Then what you could do actually is instead of uh, going to a grid of 36, then go to 12. Now here's just the 12, and this would be pretty much considering the basic color wheel. And then uh, true yellow, if you go down here, there's uh, if you go up to uh, pure yellow, this is the FF, FF, 0, 0 is pure yellow. And then blue is the same thing. It's 0, 0, 0, 0, FF. And that is usually the blue they use on websites for an active link. And then red is just the opposite of blue, which is FF, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, so, and then uh, depending on how you adjust your saturation or value, then all you're doing is adding more white, it'll slide straight across, and if you add uh, more saturation, then you're going straight towards pure red. And then your value, it'd be the same thing. It's going to take it straight up and down. It'll either add more white or more black, uh, depending on where you have it, uh, as far as uh, what what shade or what uh, hue, I should say, of, of red you have. And then uh, depending on what slider you use, you can use it. And then if you have by chance a hex number, then you could just plug that in right here and then it'll take it to the exact one. Just say, for example, uh, this I just picked on, here's my raw umber right here. And what it'll do is any color you select or even with a color picker, it will show you that exact color where it is on that wheel uh, and where you're picking from but it'll still give you all the different colors you could pick. But if you're going to pick a color from the wheel, then you may want to actually uh, just give yourself less chances. Now, if you want to even take this down even further, then you could go back to the grid and then where it says none, then give yourself maybe a five by five grid. So now you picked, 
uh, red, and then here's the different uh, variations of red it'll give you if you pick uh, just blue or purple, and then here's the different variations of, of, of blue you could have. And that is mixing it with white as your tint, going towards black as your shade. So with all that in mind, uh, that is the color wheel if you choose to use that route. So this is just some of the many ways you could just even actually obtain your colors to work from. And again, it could be overwhelming. I, I would strongly suggest just starting out with just a few colors because actually watercolor is all about water and color. And if you have your nice snappy colors of your watercolors to start out with, then you'll actually have uh, maybe something that you'll be happy with and you'll be ready to move on to more subtle shades, more subtle values, uh, more blending. Uh, but then just keep in mind, uh, we're going to go over that next with the brushes. So let's go into brushes next. Okay, let's take a look at brushes. Now I'm going to go to my supporting graphics here. We're going to open this one up here. And then just this right here, just real quick, these are the traditional paint brushes I used. And my point is, there isn't very many. I just had flats with the scraping edge on the back. Uh, these are the mops, these two here. And then these two here are liners or scripts as they're called sometimes. And then these are spotters uh, or actually just for detail uh, or actually pointers sometimes they're called. But there isn't too many. So one thing I would want to stress is then that is what I carried over into my digital brushes. I only use 15 different brushes right now. And that constantly changes because then if I run into paintings or a texture that I can't render, then I'll even either make a variation of one of these or even maybe possibly construct a whole new entire brush. Now, I'm going to go through these just quickly and we'll go through the brush layer. We'll say with red, you'll be able to see them nice. And now this one, this illuminated button right here is a reset brush change button. Uh, anything you change on your brush, it will come on if you change from the original brush. And that's kind of important because if you start designing your brushes with a specific intent in mind, then you may want to keep it that way because if you start using it and changing things all around, then you'll lose the original brush you had. So every now and then, you may want to click that and then set everything back to the way you originally designed it with all of its settings in mind. Now this right here will actually let you give you the choices of whether you want to save the volumes the size the opacity or if you even want to save uh just the paint mode involved too or it, it just uh, don't save volumes and paint mode uh into the brush presets you can save what parts you want as you do now i save everything uh, with each brush because in that way when I go back I could tell already that I don't use a, a, uh, a Blend mode again, so if I go to that one if I change it back then now it'll go back to just a paint mode So again if you start using your brushes and things start getting changed for one reason or another you may want to go back and change them back We'll start with this one uh, There's that one There's a dry a flat tooth, this is going to be actually uh, like if I was just taking a dry brush and skipping it across the paper because that is where the paint is coming off, on the tooth of the paper. Uh, and then now this one is a cloud glaze and it will change because I have this on and I want this on. Uh, this is uh, my tilt if I go up to window and then here's the tilt right here. If I have this on and all the way down, then these brush strokes are going to even be changing as I put them down. So for that reason, uh, what I'll do is I'll show you that then if I even just take the last one and make it, then here is, is it. But then as we watch, you can see the color drain out of this stroke and it's all going to end up down here with nice sharp edges. And then you can see where the paint color is ending up down in here at the very bottom because all the water is running down towards the bottom because that's the direction I have. Now the length of the line is actually how steep of an angle your paper would be and then the angle of it is actually where your paint is going to go. If I change it over that way, all the paint's going to start going this way. And so however you want to leave that uh, what angle you want. If you want your paint to run and bl blend together a little bit, then that's what you could actually do and leave that there. Now, if I turn this off just right in the center, then everything is going to pretty much stay where it's at. If I have water mixed in with the brush stroke, then it'll bleed within itself, but, it, but the tilt now will not have an effect on it. So if I go to this one, this is my, my just my regular script 
This would be equivalent to like my liner. Uh, this is a almost like an airbrush effect. So now this one will have a real soft edge compared to this one, but these are fairly fine. But now again, since I have water mixed in with this one, it's slowly blending out to a straight edge. Now, if I go to my mops, they're going to be the same as this, but they're just a lot wider. And then the same thing with my mop wet. If I zoom in, and then if I actually put this down, it's going to start off soft, but then it's going to bleed out into a very sharp edge, and then even end up with a little bit of a halo. But that will depend on how you have your visual settings, which we'll get into next. Now, if I go to this one, this is a bloom and this one, how it goes down, but since we're zoomed in, now this is what it will slowly turn into as I leave it go and as I leave the, the color run out into the water. So you can see how much that is changing in a fairly short period of time. So also when you work with watercolors in, in, in Rebel, make sure you are patient enough to leave things happen as your water mixes the colors together. Now, if I go down to the last row, these are just textures. This one I call sand, and that is because it's like a sand texture. So we will be painting sand in a, just a, a, a basic uh, photo to get us started, uh, but it's only just because of the fact that uh, it has a sand texture to it. So anytime I want to make a real fine uh, texture, that is the brush I would use. And then this one is more or less just like a spray heavy. This one is a coarse dry. Uh, this one is a splash texture and the same thing with this one. It has a slight texture to it So if I zoom in and if I add uh, more color to it You'll see it better There is the the spray in here and then the texture is in between But then if I leave it go then it's gonna all blend together So if I want to keep those strong textures within that spray I would have to fast dry it right away and then I'm gonna get really nice ragged edges off of some of these brushes uh, as the, the water carries the paint out. And then the last one is just regular spots wet, and that's all they are, and that's it. Uh, but now, uh, for a lot of these brushes, uh, just say for example, let's go with the uh, dry mop. If I open up my brush creator, and again, that's right here, window, and then just right here, brush creator, then you could go in and really start uh, dissecting what your brushes are doing now just for example this brush I have nothing but zero straight across the board so to speak and that is only because I just want a nice straight line with this particular brush I don't want any spacing I don't want any jitter and those scatter scatter is left and right if I put scatter on then it's going to start putting it to the right and left of, of my brush stroke and then if I take it off then it'll just give me a nice straight line again uh, now, my point is, all of these will change your brush stroke in one way or another, and it could get overwhelming when you start creating your own brushes. So if you do, my point in this tutorial is, keep all your other parameters the same, meaning use the same paper, use the same DPI, because that will change the size, and then other uh how would you say even whether the paper is wet or dry, keep that the same? Because then if you still don't want to work on a dry paper, and then you'll see what your actual brush stroke does without any influence from any other parameter. And then again, the same thing with angle jitter, uh, the rotation, uh, the, the pen tilt. I have no pen tilt at all or anything. I just have everything the same. And being that this is just... Uh, a plain grain and a plain uh, right here image shape, then that is pretty much straightforward too. Then if you start getting into more images, you're gonna start stacking them. I would strongly recommend uh, some of the other tutorials about brush creation. I have one on this channel and one on the Escape Motions channel also uh, that it is for four, but it would definitely still apply uh, to five, which is Rebel 5 will just give you now more options that if you start wanting to get into curves, then you will be able to adjust and fine tune uh, how your brush stroke goes down even more uh, than, than four, obviously. Uh, but it, everything that, that you could learn in four first, you could still then apply to any in your brushes in five. Uh, now let's let's take a look and see what some of these brushes could do, uh, just as a as a simple color mix, and we'll do that next. Okay, let's see what some of my brushes could do. Now I mentioned that I mixed the browns 
and blues to get my grays. So let's try that. Uh, we have, here's the visual settings. I turned down the rewet and the edge darkening just a little bit, uh, both set at two, and then everything else is set at the cold pressed paper setting. So we will leave those there. And then we, I want to wet the layer and I'll just click on the wet or dry the layer, wet the layer here in the layers menu. And I will click on this button to show my wet and I could verify the entire layer is wet. So now with that in mind, I will go to, let's take the raw umber, but what we'll do is, well, well, we'll start with the script brush here and I could turn it all the way up and then we'll start at 70. And then that way we will use that. We're just going to make a test swatch here and then take our French ultramarine blue and make a test swatch here. And keep in mind, I'm putting dry paint down on wet paper so the paint is not moving at all, even within the brush stroke uh, because uh, of no water involved. So now with that in mind, we will go to the blue uh, bloom wet. And let's see, let's actually... Uh, let's make the opacity 70 to match our swatches here, this one and this one. And then we're going to make it bigger just to give us some room to work with. Now watch what, what these strokes go down to compared to what they will end up. So in other words, be patient. There's the uh, raw umber. We'll grab the French ultramarine. And we'll put it down. And the only thing I'll do is actually give this area right in here a second coat just to see how the variations change. And then we're going to give this a little bit of time to mix. Now, if I wanted to actually uh, get a nice, even warmer cool gray, then I could use a different brush that would lay down the paint more evenly and then have to cover the first coat with the second coat pretty close to being exact. And then I won't have no pure brown or pure blue showing through where now I have a lot of character and I don't mind it in a lot of texture patterns if a little bit of pure brown or a little bit of pure blue shows through now I could already see a lot of uh, gray areas starting uh, where the paint is mixing if we zoom in let's go all the way up to uh, let's say even uh, 400% right there and then we'll be able to see the little pixels dancing away but uh, more importantly, if I grab my arrow, I could see brown here, grays in here, uh, blue in here. So you could tell they're definitely mixing. So where we pull those uh, pixels out when we take our test swatches, because that's what we're going to do next, then it'll depend on where we grab them from. And our inner circle of our, our uh, color picker will tell us that. We'll fit that back on the screen. And then we could see what's going on here as they're still mixing out. And then uh, just now what I will do is go back to my swatch brush and start pulling colors out. Let's say right there, that would be a little bit more towards the blue side. Uh, but it is definitely a little wee bit darker than this. Uh, but then depending on where we start pulling colors, they're going to be quite different. This might be towards the brown. This might be towards the blue, I think. Yes, uh, this one is pretty dark. That one's going to be towards the blue. Uh, that one's towards the brown. Some of these are very close, but they're quite different uh, than the original colors that I put down. That's towards the blue. Uh, this would be towards the brown right there. Uh, this one would be towards the, looks like pretty neutral. Uh, this one is towards the uh, fairly neutral. Uh, that one's definitely brown. And then these are just some of the colors I'm pulling out of just two colors mixed by the water. And then now keep in mind, that one's towards the blue. Let me get one more, see if we can find one more towards brown. But then now keep in mind, these are just at 70%. So now if I turn this up to 100 and start grabbing colors again, then you're going to see how many different variations of colors I could get out of just two colors mixed. And this is kind of important because I have my front rocker on my stylus set as the color picker. So as I'm painting, and we'll go over that in the shortcuts uh, later, I could pu immediately pull colors out of what I just painted. So for this reason, 
I could get quite a few different variations myself out of just mixing two colors right from the painting itself. Uh, so that's why I just choose to use a set color palette and then just pull whatever mixed colors I have out of the painting because then that way uh, they will have color unity and uh, roughly the same value of colors I'm working from. Uh, blue. Uh, that's real dark. Then you can see the, the blacks even coming in. It's already getting close to, uh, close to almost black. Uh, this one right here. Uh, let's get black and put it next to it. And you can see there isn't too much of a difference between the two. Uh, and then also, let's see, here's more blue, uh, but very dark blue. Uh, there's a lighter blue, but it's still darker than this blue, uh, also because of the percentage, but it does have a little bit of brown mixed in with it. So with that said, uh, this is just giving you an idea of why I don't use uh, the paint and mix and the paint and blend. I would prefer to let my water do the work, just like traditional colors. And I'll be talking about and bringing back traditional watercolors a lot, because there's a lot of things that still could apply from traditional watercolors in digital, only because Rebel is so close to traditional watercolors. Uh, so with that in mind, uh, let's move on to the visual settings. Okay, the visual settings, just like I went over uh, I just changed just the rewet and the edge darkening. I just dropped those down to two. And that is why we have just a little bit of a hard edge over here. But over here is a pretty nice wash to blend it right into the paper. So that is kind of like the two setting uh, for those two. And then also, uh, just to go over them uh, individually, uh, right now here's the presets. I just had it on cold press, but I slightly adjusted. it. Then there's a hot press setting, a rough paper, Japanese paper, and then also just the uh, custom setting, which if you come up with a combination of these that you like to keep, then you can just save it as the custom preset. Now, the absorbency is just nothing more uh, than how quick the paper will absorb the water. So in other words, then, if you actually have it down towards zero, then you'll have a long time for the colors to mix. Uh, just be patient, that's all. Uh, and then if you uh, want the, the re-wet uh, is something we changed. And what that is, is if you already have a color down, and then you put another color over top of it, then depending on how you have it set, if you have it set real low, uh, then what will happen is the colors will mix uh, real nice together soft. But if you start setting it up towards high, then uh, the second color may carry the first color out and push it out, and you'll have hard edges and, and a hard mix uh, where the two colors are trying to uh, blend together. Uh, the texture influence, uh, that is just a paper texture uh, that depends on uh, whether you want uh, colors to rest down into the dimples of the paper. If you actually keep it down low, then there will be very little to no influence of the paper. And then if you put it on max, then, then you'll have a hard texture uh, of the paper with, with the colors you put down. Now, the uh, edge darkening is just like what we already talked about. Uh, that is... Uh, just if you keep it down towards zero, you won't have no edges at all. And then if you put it up towards max, then you're going to have the most edge possible. And then keep that in mind. That's even if you just like I uh, did right here in this mix. That's even if you're just putting it down on clean paper uh, and you leave it bleed out. Uh, that will determine whether you're going to be left with an edge or not. Or if you just want a nice uh, soft uh, mixture right into the white paper, uh, then, then that would be depending on how you have it set. Uh, and then uh, just the last one, diffusion speed, that's just exactly what it sounds like. If you actually keep it down way low, uh, then you'll have a lot of time for the colors to blend and mix. If you put it up high uh, towards 10, then uh, they are going to blend rather quickly and you won't have as much time uh, to rearrange uh, your, your colors and your mixtures uh, as much. Uh, so uh, there again, uh, if you want, you could maybe just start straight down the middle with a cold press, which is all just about all fives and fours straight down the middle. Uh, but then also keep in mind, if you want, then you can even turn the pause off and on. And this is the pause diffusion. If I leave it on, then as I paint, it's already going to start mixing. But if I pause it, then I can have all the time in the world to put my colors down any way I want. 
and then take the pause off and then they will start mixing. So now keep in mind, they're gonna all start mixing at once, just like traditional watercolors. That's gonna be different than if you keep on working as these colors over here are blending and then you're painting down here uh, and then you're gonna get one effect down here and another effect down here. So to have a more of a sporadic look, you may want to keep painting as it's uh, actually blending because then you're gonna have a, a different look compared to letting all the colors blend at once. But now just for example, uh, if you have a lot of work that you want to paint around something and you want them all to blend evenly, then that would be the best time to actually turn on the pause, do all your painting around uh, an object or something, and then take the pause off, then all that that you painted will all blend nice out and evenly, and then you would have the same soft edge over everything that you just laid down. Uh, let's go on to the preferences and the keyboard shortcuts, or in my case, uh, the express keys. Okay, let's go over some of the uh, keyboard shortcuts, but I just want to show you just a couple of quick things back in the preferences. And then it'll make sense of why I have some of these shortcuts set the way I do. Uh, now, just as a uh, general, uh, then what I uh, just want to show you some of these things. Um, if you want to dock your panels, a uh, zoom at the cursor is pretty good. Then that way, if you want to zoom in wherever you have your cursor, that's where you'll zoom in at. Uh, so you'll stay where you want to see. Uh, the JPEG quality, I always leave at 100. Uh, and then also... Um, Show tool tips if you want to, that might help you. And then there's a couple right here. Add clear layer button to layers panel. Uh, that's this button right here, but since I don't have anything on a, uh, the layer, uh, th that one's not illuminated. But if you click that X right there, then you'll clear off that entire layer, uh, which is pretty handy sometimes if you wanna just experiment. Uh, then after the creation of a new layer, add uh, for new layer name, then that way if you click on a new layer, or if you start a new layer, it will be immediately editable, so you could add the name and then enter that. Uh, and then also, let's see, uh, that might be it there. And then if we go to the tools, uh, show cursor, I just have a circle with the direction. And then this one's handy, show paint and blend mode in cursor shape. So if it's paint, it'll be a solid circle. If it's blend, it'll be a dotted circle, which is nice to tell the difference between the two. Uh, and then brushes, this is a good one. Uh, select last paint brush when color is picked from the palette. That also works with a color picker. Uh, so that is very handy and you'll see why I have my rocker pen the way I do. Uh, and then let's see uh, anything here, no. Uh, the color, uh, if you're going to be any tracing at all, tracing color, there's a few tutorials out about that. I have one on this channel, and there's a few on Escape Emotions channel. Uh, this is just the size of pixels you'll be picking uh, if you use your uh, color picker, or also uh, when you trace and you set down your uh, brush, uh, this is the amount of color it'll be grabbing and average the uh, 5 by 5 pixel area. Uh, then um, if you, let's see, um, this is just your default settings. Here's your show wet color. I just leave these the default colors myself. That's about it for there. There's nothing under color, nothing under tab unless you have one. I'll leave that up to you. Uh, and then the keyboard shortcuts, we'll go over those next. I'll show you mine next and we'll do that uh, right now. Okay, there they are. And these are the shortcuts. Let me grab my pointer here. And then now what I want to show you is just uh, some of the shortcuts uh, that I use. Uh, now, these are my express key shortcuts. But the most important thing is actually the shortcut itself. So if you don't have express keys, you're not working on a monitor, uh, that's okay. The Some of the shortcuts you may want to consider may be the most important thing. Now, the express keys make it nice because all I have to do is touch that express key and then I immediately get that shortcut, which in this case is 16 different ones all at once. Now, for example, I have these four together because uh, this will control my canvas or paper. Uh, fit on screen, that's just control plus zero. Uh, if I press that, I'll, I'll see the entire picture at once uh, just the way it is uh, on the screen now. Then if I start zooming in, because I actually have my preferences set at zoom in 
at, at the actual cursor, then uh, if I start zooming in wherever I hold my cursor, that's where I'm going to be zooming in. So that's what I would see. Then if I go back to fit on screen, that's what I will do. Now, if I hit actual size, it's going to go all the way up to 100%, which right here is in the navigator. So then that way I will be able to see it at, at the pixel match size of 100%. And then this way I will actually show it at actual size but then since i have the zoom out right right above that then i could slowly zoom out and then start working again uh, in a bigger area if i need to or just go right back to fit on screen and then i could again see the painting all at once now the bottom four these are the ones i use quite a bit uh the undo multiple uh that is just the control plus z uh, each all these shortcuts are just listed as what they are because some of these are custom and I made them myself So I don't know if you will actually have the exact uh, same shortcuts The undo multiple is control Z that is even sometimes even when I want to even test a color uh, What I will do is actually even then just say for example if I have this I could turn the opacity down, uh, the water down, but then if I just make a test swatch, then I can actually, uh, to see, to test my color, and then if I like it, I'm okay with it, then I can undo it a couple times, take me back to a blank paper, or just where I was, and then I could go ahead and, and use that actual color that I, I tested first, and then just undid my test. Now, the translock is kind of important, only because... Uh, what I will do is I will actually use my trans lock. The transparent lock is right here, and uh, there's just lock transparency. I always just call it transparency lock. Uh, what I could do then is just say, for example, if I take this nice vivid uh, uh, permanent magenta, and I'll turn up the opacity a little bit, turn up the water a lot, and if I go down, even just right on this paper here, and then hit my transparent lock right away and then go to a nice vivid French ultramarine blue. If I start putting that down, I'm only going to be putting it down on what purple I've already put down. So if I start zooming in, then I will see that everything's mixing, but it's only mixing in a very specific area. So it's going to make that pattern look a lot more complicated than it really is. So now, now that they're all mixing, if I take a nice vivid red and put it in there too, then it's only going to be mixing... Uh, right where I put down the first layer of purple and now it's starting to bloom out a little bit and it'll start giving me some very interesting shapes and and textures and then right below it is actually my fast dry so if I see what I like and I want to stop it then I just quick dry it and that would be up here in the upper left hand corner it'll show my fast dry and then I will save what I have and then of course right below that is the hand and then I can move things around as I want, uh, depending on what area I want to work at next, uh, and then just uh, use my hand there. And then again, these are all the uh, shortcuts I use, uh, uh, the keyboard shortcuts. And then now, for example, these are the ones I could use with my left hand rather easily. Uh, so I could use two hands at once, but then these are the ones that I don't mind using my right hand for. So if I start a new layer, uh, that would be this one here, then that's just control shift plus N. If I hit this express key, now I got a layer ready to go, but because I had set in my preferences that it will be editable as soon as I start, then I could go ahead and type in the name and then hit enter right below it. And then I will already have my new layer but then if I want that layer to be wet, then I can immediately wet the layer, which I could verify with the show wet. And then now that layer is wet and it would be all ready to go, uh, ready to start painting something else with that given painting. Then if I am using a mask system, which we will be using uh, for this painting, then I could immediately uh, label that as an influence layer, but because I'm not working with any mask right now, it's only gonna show the dot, but it won't be illuminated as if I had a mask on it. And then the bottom four, this is just a dry layer. So in other words, if I, uh, if I use the fast dry, the quick dry, it will stop what's mixing, but it will leave the layer wet. So if I want to completely dry the layer, then what I could do is then just hit uh, this button right here, dry layer, and then it'll completely dry it, even though it's showing wet. Uh, there's nothing wet to show, so it's a completely dry layer. And then the sponge, uh, what, what I will do there is if I will show you uh, in this particular drawing that 
Uh, just say, for example, if we re-wet the layer, and that would be right here. And then now if I use my sponge, uh, that would be this right here. If I go into my sponge tools, depending on what I use, just say, for example, this square one here. And I'll make it a little bit bigger so we can see what we're doing. Then I can actually pull water out depending on where I want and make different shapes or different areas that I want to work with. So then when I drop color in here, it's going to puddle around these areas. Uh, just say, for example, we will do that. And we'll dry that area. And just as a quick demo, I will turn off the water and then go to my colors. Uh, we'll just grab a, just say, for example, the purple. And again, as soon as I grab my color, I will go to the last brush I used, which is a very nice setting too. But then if I do this and then actually go to my tilt and then take it down and leave it run, it's going to keep on running until it runs into that area I dried. So now it's running into that area dried. This will go around this way and drip down. But here's the area I dried, which is right here. So it's stopping right there. And it'll go down around this way because this, uh, this area is still wet. But then I'm, what I'm doing is controlling where I want the paint to uh, blend and bleed to. And then if I have my tilt on, it will also control what direction it's going to go or stop. Turn that off. And then that's where I left my dry shape there. So uh, again, the colors blended and mixed nicely all around uh, my dry spot. And then uh, everything else stayed just the way it was. And then the very bottom one is the eraser. And that is just E. Uh, and then that way, if I want to actually go back uh, to the uh, eraser, uh, I can use that. But then it's nice that if you have a brush on, if I use my cloud brush, but then I use it as an eraser, which would be right here, and then go back and lift out the colors however I want. If I want to make it bigger, then I'll be lifting out some of the paint in different areas, and then I could go backwards if I added too much color, or if I even want to make my uh, pattern a little bit more complex by taking it back to the white of the paper. And then now, uh, the last thing I need to show you is the stylist we'll turn this one off we'll turn that one off and then we'll go to the stylus and if i go to this and grab my red i have it all the way up uh, this is the stylus pen i use and just so you know the one i'm painting uh, this uh, rocker right here is my alt key which is my actual color picker so if i press it i'm going to be immediately able to pick a color and then this one is actually my blend so I have it set on blend as my shortcut. Uh, and then that way, if I click back, back rocker, it will immediately go uh, to my uh, blend mode. And then this way, if I pick a color, it's going to automatically go to the previous brush I used. And then if I click the back rocker, it will immediately go to the blend mode. And this is kind of like my system that I use that I've gotten comfortable with and uh, works rather well so far, but I may tweak things here and there. So now with all this said, and everything we've went over, and it is just a scratch of the surface of how many different things you could adjust and change uh, within Rebel 5, let's move on and actually start a painting. Okay, let's take a quick look and see what we're going to be painting here. Uh, just, uh, just as I brought it up uh, to create your color palette from... Uh, it's just going to be just basic leaves and this is what I was trying to stress just start off with something that we could finish and then just uh, pick our colors from uh, and then create some textures and patterns and uh, just even to mix colors everything uh, just to get started with uh, this will be our picture here and then we already know how we could create the sand pattern with the sand brush and I just called it that by coincidence but the point will be with this, though, is that we, we probably should uh, create the sand in proportion with the leaves. Because if you create sand too big or too small, then it, it might not look like what you mean it to do. Uh, and then also just the same thing with all your textures and, and any kind of patterns that you render. If you're trying to render a specific texture or pattern, uh, then it has to be in proportion with what you're trying to do again. And we'll go into that next after I speed draw it. Let's get started. Just a brief note on drawing. Uh, try to freehand draw as much as you can 
Because just remember, when you're freehand drawing, you're learning your proportions, hand-eye coordination, and another thing that painting is actually just drawing with color. Okay, let's take a look at our drawing here. And I cleaned it up just a little bit here and there. Now what I'm going to do is go around the entire perimeter of just the leaves and stems. Uh, that then I'm going to create that into a mask. And the only reason why we want to do that is just to protect all the leaves from the sand pattern. And then we'll even be able to go in and separate each leaf if we want to. But once we get our mask done, uh, we'll go over that process. Uh, so let's go ahead and uh, get started with the mask. Okay, let's go ahead and get started on our mask layer. Uh, just as a refresher, I'm going to keep uh, this image on another monitor to maximize our space. I'll go ahead and close this down. And since we just finished up the drawing, I will make sure I go up on my mask layer and it's turned on. And then we will also go ahead and start. And what we're going to do is actually uh, just go right around the perimeter. And I'm going to pick my script brush. We're going to turn it down just a little bit in size. And I'll show you why. The opacity has to be up to 100 and the water, no water at all, because we don't want that line to vary at all. Uh, this is for a mask. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to completely separate the leaves and the stems from the sand because they're going to be two completely different patterns. So uh, for this reason, I want to do a carefree type pattern on my leaves without being constrained of painting around something. Now, if you paint around different things for different reasons, that's fine. But in this particular case, I just want to establish a specific scale to my pattern uh, for a specific reason, and I don't want to be hindered uh, by my boundaries. So for that reason, uh, we're going to just go right around all the leaves and make them uh, the mask itself. And let's go ahead and do this, but we'll fast forward for this. Okay, now there is the, uh, the complete outline of the leaves. Uh, this one needs colored in yet, this one needs colored in yet, and then the stems are all separated too. So whether the stems are in a shadow or not is not important to me right now. It's just the patterns. I just want to keep the stem and leaves separate from the sand. So now if I want to fill this in, here's where your solid good op uh, 100 op opacity line is important. If I took my eraser and just say, for example, we'll take it way down and we'll put just a tiny little break somewhere in this line that you may not even be able to see if i go to use my fill bucket uh, or also more importantly if it's a sketchy line and it's not one a good solid line that leaves little gaps within the uh, brush stroke we'll go to our black we have it we want to make sure this is a continuous and then anti-aliasing is fine if i uh, click on it now it's going to fill the entire page with the exception of these down here because they're separated out. Uh, so for that reason, uh, I don't want that. I will undo that. And then if I go back in and actually just take my black and just close that shut again. Now if I use my fill bucket, it just fills within my line. Uh, I will fill this one in. And then that's it. We are done. Now this is a shadow down here of this leaf curling in and out. And then all the rest of these are shadows. So how they get cast across those stems, uh, we'll figure that out when we're starting to paint. But this is the outline we need right now. And then we'll go over that next. Okay, now that we got our uh, mask complete, I am on the mask layer to apply the mask. We just go to the M in the layers panel and then click on it. And then what you could either do is go to mask opaque or also mask transparent. If you mask opaque, then what that will do is actually uh, just mask the area that is black. So we'd only be able to work in the white area. Now I want to paint the leaves first. So we're going to mask transparent. Now that means we'll only be able to paint in the black area. Now you could also go under layer two and then right here with masking layer, no mask, mask opaque, mask transparent. That's your other choice to apply this mask. But for now, we're only going to work within the leaves. And then, but keep in mind also, uh, we don't have to look at the mask all the time. Now the mask layer is only going to be used for the mask. That's uh, it, You can't use it for any other reason. So, but what we can do is either turn the opacity completely off or what is sometimes better is just turn it off so you can't see it. 
And then if you need to remind yourself where your layer is at some point through the painting, then you can just turn it back on. But turning it off will not affect the uh, working properties of the mask at all. Now I went ahead and added some different uh, leaf uh, layers down here and I'll show you why. We're going to turn this one on. Just as they are in the photo, this will be number one, two, three, four, five, and they're just in order of how they overlap each other. Now your first option to paint this is actually paint it in the traditional watercolor way and then just work uh, with all your light colors and then go to dark and then uh, no return unless you want to use your eraser or if you start using opaque colors then you might lose your transparent quality of your multiple layer buildup. And you'll see what I mean by that that if we add layers towards the end to just give it a very slight, gl a slight glaze of one color or another it will make a difference. But now if we actually paint it in a traditional way we'll also lose some of the benefits of digital. And what I mean by that is if we want to take some of these leaf layers and apply a blending mode or even just clean up the edges, uh, we'll have that opportunity if each leaf is on its own layer. Uh, otherwise, if they're all on the same layer, uh, it might be a little bit tougher to try and lighten or darken up one layer, especially lighten without affecting the, the uh, leaf beside it. So for that reason, just to give yourself options and to take advantage of digital painting, uh, that you may want to leave some objects on individual layers uh, so you can adjust them as you want. Uh, let's look into some of the ways we can actually block out each individual leaf so we can work on it one at a time. Okay, let's start painting leaf one. Uh, and I will go down and turn these off and go to layer leaf one. And uh, we uh, already have our mask on and the paper is not wet because I don't want it wet. I'm showing wet and there is none only because I want my texture of my brush to take effect. Uh, if I wet the layer, then it will bleed out too quick and I'll just have real soft colors one on top of another without any texture. So uh, the trick of this is going to be to use my bloom wet and then fast dry it quick enough if I need to. Uh, just to stop the texture where it's at. Now we're going to go in and we're going to see and uh, maybe uh, the quinacridone gold and a little bit of the real light raw umber. So we'll go to that. Uh, that would be fine. And then I will uh, overlap some of these leaves, but that's okay because all these leaves are darker than this leaf. So anything I overlap will just be a start of the next leaf. And I will start with just quinacridone gold. And we're going to just go right around here and I will quick dry that and then right around here I can even go a little wee bit darker and right through here is pretty good and if we leave it mixed a little bit we'll start to get some patterns of mixing I'm gonna go with the burnt sienna right across here also quick dry that and then uh, let's see, we're going to go with uh, more quinacridone on gold right through here, right there. Now, if you see the fast dry come up here, you know, I just used it. And there's a vein right there that this little streak is dark all the way down into here. But then I'm going to add, just for watercolor's sake, a little bit of cobalt violet right in here, right there. Then a little bit right in here, quick dry that right there, right through here is a good bit, down here, and then now uh, maybe even just a little bit of real light cobalt blue right there, that'll help out the uh, cobalt violet there and there, and then that's it for this one. Now keep in mind that we're going to go later on over these veins and everything, but once I'm fairly done, then I will actually take a small brush as an eraser and go back in and write those lines out as a uh, light highlight. That would be easier than trying to paint around them. And then, but the only thing is you could see some of these have shadows right alongside the white line and just that very subtle touch of a shadow 
along that white line will make it more look like a shape than a line. Uh, so uh, we will take it back out and I will leave it there. And if you use your space bar or hand, uh, you'll also be able to move the photo around uh, within the uh, reference panel frame. Now I'm gonna leave this right here. We'll zoom in and even just to see what we got and you can see the textures a little bit better. You can see how the blues uh, blended a little bit, but then if I turn my drawing off, you'll see a little bit better than now what we have without the problems of, of the drawing uh, just distracting from our uh, very subtle wash. Because uh, keep in mind, this is going to be the lightest part of just about all the leaves. So we will center it up again. And now uh, what we could do is uh, we'll, we'll uh, leave this here, but then we'll go over next how we could uh, start sectioning off some of the other leaves if we want to keep them on their individual layers. Okay, before we go into how we could mask off our next leaf that we're going to work on, uh, notice the quinacridone gold throughout the whole entire photo. That is where the beauty of layers and also the mask comes in. And what I mean by that is if we go down to sand, we're going to create a new layer. And we'll just call it uh, background. And I am going to move that below the sand. Uh, but then now that it's not influenced, what I will do is actually go to my wet mop. And I can actually, uh, I'll leave it set at three and it's as big as it's going to get. So I will go with the quinacridone gold and then I am going to give it a real light wash over everything. And then keep in mind, as long as I'm holding down, nothing's going to blend or move. So I will just hold it down till I get everything covered that I want covered and then lift up and then leave that bleed for a while. Now this kind of like would be a preliminary wash uh, that will tie your shapes together, uh, that this is what's called color unity. And because you'll have quinacridone gold and very light amounts throughout everything within the picture, under the sand, under the leaves, uh, it all makes a difference because with transparent colors, uh, what colors you put down will affect how the next layers look. I'm leaving this blend out and I'm just leaving the water do the work. I don't want to mess with blenders or, or move things around or add things because then it's going to start creating shapes that I may not want. I just want a really soft uh, quinacridone gold layer and that's it. So uh, it's just like traditional colors in a way that I could say don't mess with it. Just leave it blend and leave it go. Okay, now that that's been blending out for a while. I will uh, quick dry that so it, we know it's going to stay right where it's at now. And then now we can actually go back. Uh, let's open up our reference. And then let's do uh, just the uh, leaf number two next. It's fairly dark, but we'll do it next. Because uh, being that we're putting them all in, on different layers, one will overlap the other, but to a certain extent it won't matter which one we do and when. So we will go actually to leaf number two. And then we could verify that by putting our back on. Yeah, this is the one we will do next, leaf number two. And I'll turn that off. And then now what we're going to do, though, is we're going to actually go up here and we're going to go to our freehand tool. And just remember, uh, you can't lift up till you're completely done. And I will zoom in and we're going to actually block this one out. Okay, we'll let that join up and there it is. Okay, now what I could do is go ahead and then start. I'll go back to my bloom brush. Uh, we're going to take, well, we can even take it up just even a little bit more. And again, let's see, we'll verify that this layer is dry because I don't want it wet only because then if it's wet, it's going to bleed out too quick and I want my texture to take effect and that's why I'm quick drying fairly fast uh, as soon as I lay the uh, paint down. We're going to start still with the quinacridone gold and the oranges and we'll just kind of start giving it a little bit of wet here and there and you can see what kind of patterns it's putting down now that it's bigger and then we're going to put a little bit of orange in too in the highlighted areas because the orange is a little bit brighter and hotter than the uh, quinacridone gold Okay, then now we could put in our burnt sienna. And 
And then let's see, we'll start putting in a little bit. Uh, let's go with the cobalt violet first. And then just add some color to it. And this shape right in here, we can even put that in separate and just put in a line right there and then paint out towards the uh, top of it. And, and we'll get a sharp line on one side and a soft edge on the other. And then this has to go quite a bit darker. We'll start going with the burnt umber. And this will go darker right in here. And then we'll take that real dark. But that is just about a straight edge. So we can actually even soften up one side. And then make a sharp edge on the other. And then this down in here. Make that just a little bit dark. Okay, that. And then let's see now. Being that this is already wet, then we'll be actually be able to go back to this layer at any time we want and then just use a transparent lock, which means then we will only be able to paint on what's painted now. If you want to change the size of that layer, then you may have to take the uh, transparent layer off. But what we'll do now is we'll hit Control D, and then now I could put in uh, actually the uh, mask again, but right here where it's at. I will uh, zoom in and then also zoom in to our picture and you can use the hand for this just like that and then what we'll do is this right here and I am going to make that edge just to give it a start so what we could do is just like this we'll go like this straight back this way but then I will just go back around this and all the way out here, because this side doesn't matter. This is going to be a soft blend anyway. And then that's where we'll end it. But then uh, right here to get this, I will go back to my burnt sienna. Make this a little bit smaller. And quick dry that. Quick dry that. Burnt umber. Right through here. Quick dry that. Now even if I go outside of my line now... It's not going to matter because I, I still have my mask on. So even though I went outside the line, I'm still not going to be able to go any further than my original mask. Okay, there. And then let's hit Control D to take out the line. Uh, we'll fit it on screen. And then we'll get rid of our drawing just to see what we got. So then now you can see how it's starting to shape up. Uh, this will be the next leaf. And then we have a long ways to go yet. Uh, but we will do some of this speed painting, but I want to show you enough options and enough techniques uh, real time that you could get the uh, gist of what we're doing. Okay, let's move on to the next leaf. Okay, let me show you one last way to section off a leaf. And we will go back and actually turn our drawing back on. Now, just as I mentioned before, though, just real quickly, uh, this is leaf two. If I make this a transparent lock, and then I actually just say, for example, take any brush and any color. Uh, we'll just even take just the uh, mop. We'll give it a little bit of opacity. Put red down. If I take it back over that, then I'm only going to give it a light red wash just over that leaf. Because I have my transparent locked down. So now I don't need the selection tool anymore. We will undo that. And then I will take off the transparent lock of that one for now. But that is one good way then that once you have your area defined uh, on an individual layer, then you can go back in and just transparent lock it and uh, work on uh, anything you want because we're going to have to make these edges a lot darker in different areas, but we will be able to with a nice sharp edge uh, by using a transparent lock. Uh, now, the last one is I'm going to go and do, we'll do uh, just number four. We will go to layer number four. But what I'm going to do this time is I am actually going to use the water tool uh, to actually uh, separate it out. So what we'll need is the show wet on. And I'm going to zoom in a little bit. And I could take my good old time doing this. But we're going to just go right around the edge. Okay, that's it. Now that I have that colored in... Uh, with just wet water, clear water, before I turn the show wet off, I can make it a transparent lock, and then I'll turn that off, and now I'll only be able to work within that area. 
So if we get started on this leaf here, we can see it's a lot darker uh, than uh, all the other leaves. And just to get it started, this will be the last one I'll do. And I'm just going to go into the speed painting and just finish all the leaves. We'll zoom out just a little bit. But you can see how dark this is. But now being that it's wet now, this leaf was dry when I first started it. And we made it wet by putting paint down and then we could transparent lock it. It's already transparent lock, but it's already wet. Let's go to uh, just a little wee bit of quinacridone golden orange just to get us started. Uh, and again, I will have to be quick with the fast dry if I want to hold my texture. Now we could cut the water back a little bit and that'll help uh, just by putting it down. Uh, and then it won't uh, blend and bleed real quick. As you can see, it's okay. But now it's also just going where I actually put the water. And we got a little bit of quinacridone gold in here. And I already hit it. And then this is going to be real dark in here. But then there's a little subtle glow in here. So we'll work it up to the glow and then darken this edge up up here. And let's see. There's like a, a real strong uh, purplish blue in here too. So we're going to do that. And then we'll just snap up the colors just a little bit. And then this we could uh, uh, separate out too. A couple different ways, the same way. And then you can see where the, where the leaf is uh, translucent. Uh, we'll put a good bit of orange right there. And then we'll go back in and darken it. Okay, and I think we're ready for our burnt sienna. And then this hard edge we will also put in. And I'm hitting the fast dry pretty quick. There's a lot of dark, and we'll go sepia and French ultramarine blue even back in here, because you can even see a little bit of the blue right there. And that'll even just snap it up anyway. If I want to make it darker, so I don't keep on overlapping my pattern, I'm going to keep it, well, I can make it a little bit bigger, but then darker. And I can make some of these a sharp edge here, too. In fact, let's do that right now. it we'll go with that I could tone that line down just a little bit and we'll leave that translucent part there quick try that and let's go back out and then turn off our drawing and see what we got and as it all comes together we'll see how when once we start getting our lines in small uh, dot patterns, uh, a little bit of everything, uh, that once we get our hard shadows down in here, uh, what I will do is I'll get all the leaves done and we'll take it down to the sand and then we'll go from there. Okay, I just keep on working in with the Cobalt Violet Burnt Sienna, Cobalt Blue, all the colors again there. If you caught that, I am actually erasing around some leaves. So if you keep them on their own individual layers, then it'll give you the opportunity that you may not even have to mask them off. 
you can just clean up the edges after you're completely done with your washes. But the most important thing is, is to give yourself the opportunity to create your patterns of your brush in proportion with what you're trying to render. If that spotty pattern was too big or too small, it would look quite different. Working with the veins, I will put them on their own layer so I could adjust them later. And then I may make things change uh, the values, the colors, lighten them or darken them. But I like to see how everything looks all together. This way it gives me an idea of what needs to go lighter or darker. Because in the end, you can't have dark without light and you can't have light without dark. And with transparent watercolors, sometimes it's a little bit dangerous to try and darken something up just to make something else look light. Okay, we got just enough of the leaves done to go ahead and put in the sand. So I don't know if you noticed or not, but I also used uh, un unbleached white as far as just putting in some of my lines. That is just to give you an option that if you put some of your detail work and you just want to start to see how it looks on any uh, type of watercolor, then uh, you can put it on a separate layer at the very top. Then that way, if you want to go back in and work on some of the other layers underneath, uh, sometimes it really helps to see the painting as a whole, uh, whether you need to tone down your highlights or tone down some of your other uh, areas or even add deeper shadows uh, in some other areas too. This glow down here could make it darker, but I want to wait until I put in the shadows and see what they look like. But then if I want to make them darker, I can. But if I want a strong glow off the sand, then it, it will really look illuminated from the light, uh, direct light reflecting off of the somewhat bright sand. Uh, let's go ahead and put in the sand just to see where we're at. Okay, we got some of the sand in just to give us an idea what it would look like. Every now and then I was going back over with the eraser setting too at full opacity uh, just to soften things up and take some of them out. Then it'll create a pretty intense pattern. You can even make some of the sand just a little bit bigger. But what we're going to do now is just going to go back in. I'm going to clean everything up, finish this leaf, pull out some more spots, some more highlights, and we're going to wrap this one up and call it quits. Let's finish it up. Okay, we're almost there, uh, but I noticed that in our photograph, it is a good bit more orange and gold compared to our painting. So we're going to move this off and then I'm just going to build another layer and I'll wet it and we're going to go back to our orange, our mop and we're going to make it as big as it can and then a number four but then we are going to give it a coat of one more coat of orange and then we will just leave it bleed out a little bit and remember if I don't pick up I will have a nice even coat because I'm using a real big soft edge brush it should blend out into the paper nicely and we'll leave that go and the remove layer down here I want to show you something in particular we are going to go back in and clean this area up a little bit I think I made it a little bit too dark so I want to go back in and try and fix it and this would just be a way we could fix things since we're working in layers. Uh, right now, I want to go ahead and quick dry that. And then we will go ahead in and fix this. Okay, let's go ahead and fix that. What I need to do is go to the mask, put it on transparent, because we're only going to be working on the leaves. And then I'm going to zoom in. And we're going to take some of that out. We'll go to the eraser. And we'll use the real soft eraser. I have to go to layer number four, leaf number four. And then we are going to slowly take a little bit of that out at a time. But here's what I want to show you. Now, it should be coming out more than that. But it's not. And the reason why 
is there is a very hard pattern behind that. So just to show you, if I go down to remove and turn it off, there's my layer that's causing me the trouble. So now if I need that somewhere else, I can actually leave everything there, but then just go to the remove layer and I can even take the opacity all the way down on my eraser and just take that out of just where I don't want it on that particular leave and then we could go back in and rebuild that particular pattern that we started with and that would almost be kind of like retouching skills so now we will leave that there and then we will go back in and go back to number four and we're going to lighten it up even a little wee bit more now that we can see what we're doing and let's see nope too much we're going to take the opacity back down just a little bit at a time. We can leave the very bottom a little bit darker. That would be where it's darkest. Right here in the round part of the leaf is where it would be the lightest. I could keep on taking it down so I could go back to a pretty vibrant orange. Otherwise, it might look a little bit muddy looking. It could be broken up, but I'd still like a good bit of brightness. Now, I might even have some other colors in there somewhere else. So if I turn off my layer, yes, there are other colors there from somewhere else. Let's see, leaf five. That's where they're at, leaf five. So we could even take them down there. We'll even take a little bit more off. That's a pattern I don't need in leaf. I'm only working on leaf five layer, so I'm not bothering leaf four at all now we'll go back to leaf four grab our orange and we well that mops too big but well we could cut it down and then we're going to put in a nice coat but we have to turn the water all the way down and we're going to put in a nice coat of orange and then we could go back in and build that up with our bloom brush no water I don't want no water it'll run things crazy and let's see we'll start with burnt sienna just to make it darker again and here's our texture we can turn it down maybe just a little bit of water but I'm gonna have my finger on the old quick dry that's getting better raw umber and now keep in mind, since we have our opaque highlights on the very top layer, one of the very top layers, we're not going to affect those at all. We're painting in underneath them too. Uh, and then we are going to go back to just a little bit of cobalt blue. Let's take the purple first. That's a little bit warmer. The cobalt violet, that's a little bit warmer than the and we'll make some textures here and there within that pattern. And then let's push this while we're there. Let's go back to just a small uh, script brush. And I'm going to pull out some colors right there. And we're just going to go over this. I want it darker than that. Now we can even make the top of this just a little bit darker. We'll go back to the brush, bloom, and we're going to make the top just a little bit darker too. We'll go with the raw umber. Purple. And I'm painting underneath five, so we're not hurting anything there. We're going to set that very edge back in a little bit. Let's see how that looks. Yeah, that's a better glow to it. We can even change this around a little bit. That's not too bad. 
Okay, what we'll do is we're going to go back in and clean all these different areas up for one final time. But I will completely finish it up and then we'll have our final thoughts. Okay, while I finish up the uh, final touches on the watercolor, sometimes this is the most important part of your painting. So make sure you finish your paintings as often as you can, no matter what stage you're at. The entire purpose of this tutorial was just to show you how many different options you have in any phase of a watercolor. Just make sure you give yourself a chance, be patient, and take the time to learn. Okay, the final touches are done. Time to take a look and see what the finished piece looks like. I went ahead and changed some things. Uh, the first big change I want to show you is I actually duplicated over leaf number four. Here was the original one right here. I did this one uh, while we were chatting about it. And then I went ahead and duplicated that layer over and got this one. And I think I like this one better. This one is more like the photo where the glow is at the very bottom. And I think I like that better. And it kind of looks more like the, the orangier sand is uh, shining back up in underneath the leaf. And I also put a little wee bit more orange uh, texture in the actual uh, leaves shadow. Uh, I also went back in and made some of these translucent and lighten them up a little bit and then put more orange and cobalt violet in them. I lightened up these uh, little curls here and this one here and made them a little bit translucent. And then I went ahead and darkened some up and I even gave this entire leaf a couple spots around here. Just a real subtle uh, light glaze just to darken them up just a little bit. And that's this one right here above. And that's without it, and then that's with it. And so with the glazing of, of watercolors, you can make such subtle changes. Uh, it will be your choice whether uh, you like it or not. But if you keep it on individual layers, uh, you will have options. The stems, I went ahead and lightened some of them up and just sharpened some of their uh, shadowed areas and just to find which ones were in the sun and then also where the sun was hitting and casting shadows uh, and then just a little bit of glow in the sen uh, sen uh, sand back there and then the uh, actual also um, the sand itself I put a little bit more texture in it but I put it also on its own layer because then keep in mind I could use the transparency lock again and then go back in if I want to and make even certain sections or, or grains of sand even darker uh, just by even with any type of flat brush or anything then only because I'll be able to pick and choose if I try to do that with a full brush I'm going to make one mark one value another mark another value and it'll almost be like what I would call leaving tracks uh, everywhere your brush went with a specific color this way you could kind of disguise the brushwork and make it look more like a uh, sporadic sand color that you may want to. Uh, with everything else all done and pretty much in place, uh, transparent watercolors are not easy, but they're worth the uh, time. So the only thing I could say is when you start your paintings, try to finish them. Uh, if you learn anything at all, it may be what not to do the next time. And that is worth learning. And then also uh, patience and take time to learn because they're not easy. When you work from light to dark with no return, uh, you can't go back in and cover things up. Or then it would be considered a mixed media and not a transparent watercolor. With all that said, I hope you've enjoyed this tutorial. If you made it this far, congratulations. Until I see you out in the field or at the studio, bye for now.